Welcome to this lecture. We're going to be discussing two different topics, African-American clients and multicultural clients. Let's get started. So according to your textbook, it's really important for us, and we've talked about this quite a bit, I feel like at this point in the semester, it's important for us as counselors to be paying attention to characteristics and be um, culturally sensitive to individuals and whatever those individual characteristics are, um, acknowledging those characteristics, paying attention to them and incorporating them into therapy can be really beneficial um, for the client and whatever they're facing. Uh, paying attention to racial identity will likely play a role for a lot of clients that we see, especially, you know, America is kind of called the melting pot. Um, and so depending on where you're working, you might see clients with, um, you know, such a vast range of cultural factors, especially if you're someplace like New York, Chicago, San Francisco, etc. Um, and depending on who the clients are, they might want to explore racism or other racial identity factors that are occurring either that have occurred in the past or that are currently impacting them. So something to be paying attention to. And of course, um, you know, if you have, uh, you know, those blind spots or making assumptions or that type of thing about cultural factors that one, that you explore that on your own and process through that, but two, that you're open to discussing that with the client so that they're able to work through whatever they need to in therapy. For African-American clients, there's several different factors that might be playing a role, and these are covered in more detail in your textbook. So blood relatives and co close family friends, um, the family structure might be slightly different. Um, and so we as therapists would want to clarify that in terms of factors like who's living in the home, who helps with childcare, because either extended family or friends who aren't actually blood relatives um, might be considered family. And so, you know, someone might say, oh, that's my uncle, that's my aunt, oh, that's my brother, that's my sister, when in reality, it's they're not blood, um, but they're considered family relationships in that sense. Um, so paying attention to what the family structure is and that it might be more complex for African-American clients. Uh, protective factors. So religion and spirituality tends to be protective in the sense that it can provide higher levels of resilience. So people who are religious or spiritual, they do have that higher level of resilience um, in two ways. Uh, one is that, you know, they might pray or rely on God in terms of helping them as a coping strategy to help them get through hard times. And two is that if they attend church regularly or some type of, um, you know, religious entity um, or structure like, you know, going to uh, mass or uh, a synagogue or, or whatever it is, um, you know, depending on what their religious preference is, that can, you know, other church members um, can also act as a support system for them. Pay attention, though, that religion can also be a significant stressor if it's driving either unrealistic expectations or unhelpful thought patterns or causing family members who are really religious to, like, alienate um, whoever, you know, that person is. So, for example, LGBTQ might not feel very supported by family members who are very religious and have these, like, rigid uh, religious beliefs about LGBTQ individuals. So pay attention to that and explore with the client, you know, what role does religion or spirituality play for you? And a lot of clients will say none at all, but a lot of clients will also say, hey, it's really important to me in these ways or in, in this, um, you know, in this aspect. And so paying attention to that, but also exploring, is it something that they want to incorporate into therapy? We talked about the wealth gap, I think last week in terms of how it impacts, you know, men versus women. And so it also plays a role for African-American and colored individuals. Caucasian individuals have a net worth that is 13 times greater than African-Americans. 13. That's really high. Um, and so, you know, that highlights that African-Americans are at a financial disadvantage as compared to Caucasian individuals. I'll talk about education in the next slide. Um, strengths and identity. So strengths, um, there's several different aspects. Identity and racial pride tends to be one strength. Um, you know, having 
racial pride in who you are, in your background, and where you come from. And you can see this depending again on the culture um, or the different subgroup in terms of how people were raised. Um, you know, a lot of people have uh, pride in Africa or coming from Africa, they'll wear African colors um, or clothing. And so paying attention to is there any pride that they have. Um, lower levels of heavy drinking. So drinking can cause all kinds of problems, especially if there's heavy or binge drinking. And African Americans tend to be at, um, in, engage in lower levels of drinking overall. Flexibility in family roles, which we talked about a minute ago in terms of that family structure, um, can result in more support system or, um, you know, more individuals helping, you know, there's that saying, it takes a village to raise a child. Well, if you've got more family members or more individuals in general, friends, family, friends, etc., who are supporting you and helping you, that can be really beneficial. Racism and discrimination. So a study in 2004 showed that people with African-American sounding names on their resume didn't receive as many calls for an interview. So in fact, Caucasian individuals received 50% more calls for interviews than individuals who had an African-American sounding name. So discrimination is uh, alive and well, if you will. So paying attention to that and how um, being African-American might play out in a work role or a work environment and how um, there might be discrimination in terms of hiring practices or um, just what that might look like in a workplace for individuals. One of your assignments ha is heavily focused on incorporating media such as movie, news articles, and that's because a study in 2017 found that black families were significantly more likely to be portrayed by the media as dependent, dysfunctional, and criminal. So where do a lot of us get our information from? Well, it comes from news, watching TV, movies, but those portrayals are overly focused on African Americans as criminals, whereas that's not actually the case in real life, um, especially not to that high percentage of how it's portrayed. Um, so, you know, you have to think about, well, what sells? Where does the money come from? Well, what sells is drama, right? Drama, negativity. Um, and so that's what's then portrayed. So things to be paying attention to and thinking about for African American clients. Investigators, um, so a Harvard University professor and an elementary principal, uh, teacher principal at a school told, so this is, I think this research study is fascinating. They told elementary school teachers that based on their students' standardized test scores, certain children were late bloomers and could be expected to experience growth spurts. Um, in truth, there were no tests that actually existed for this. It was part of the research study. Um, and the children who were designated as growth spurts um, or children who would have a growth spurt were chosen at random. So the test didn't actually exist. It's just what they told the teachers to be able to study this. And findings showed that the teachers then, because of what they were told, actually changed their expectations around that student in terms of having, having higher expectations for students in terms of academic achievement. And so what does that then impact? Well, it impacts how the student is then starts to react. So the teacher starts to treat you a certain way, um, expecting you to do well, expecting you to get good grades. And then that then impacts the students. Um, and when teachers expect students to fail, then they tend to fail, right? It's those small cues that come up in terms of what's said or maybe a comment that's said or how a, a teacher might treat a student in terms of a certain grade that they, they might get on a test or a quiz or whatever it is. Um, and so unsurprisingly, um, teachers have lower expectations for African-American children compared to Caucasian children. Uh, this is covered on page 307 of the textbook where girls, African-American girls or black girls are at higher risk as compared to their peers. So they receive less support from teachers um, in terms of like less attention um, for like school assignments or in class as compared to their male counterparts. And schools might not necessarily intervene or take action if sexual harassment is occurring or is reported by uh, by girls at school. Lack of parent support. So, you know, if a parent is, say, a single parent or 
working multiple jobs or even if there's two parents in the household but you know they're both trying to make ends meet they might not be able to make school functions or maybe don't have the bandwidth to provide um, you know emotional support academic support depending on the parents level of education you know especially if a student is maybe very gifted or excelling they might kind of be out of their depth like you're good at math I can't help you good luck um, whereas, you know, if you look at uh, Caucasian households, usually the a lot of times the education level is higher. There is more support. There's more bandwidth um, to be able to support students, show up to games, that kind of thing. Public schools in general, um, especially in low income neighborhoods, tend to just push kids through because they get state funding for students who graduate. Uh, but of course, that's not actually helpful in terms of students who, if you're not learning anything or you're not learning what you actually need to learn to be able to succeed or be competitive for college or getting a job, it's actually just harmful in the long run. But, you know, it's all about where does the money come from. So, some things to be paying attention to or thinking about in terms of those educational pieces. So research, the purpose of this research was to examine the relationship between the black church or, you know, how individuals use the church or um, interact with the church and mental health services or the needs of members who are attending the church and looking at addressing those needs from the perspective of counselors within the church. So this is really interesting because we kind of talked about, you know, religion and spirituality a minute ago. Uh, so there's two different types of data that can be collected. There's quantitative data, which looks at numbers, um, and it can easily be measured because of numbers. And then there's qualitative data, which describes, uh, you know, characteristics and qualities. Um, so for example, trust. Trust is something that can is hard to be measured. Like, do you trust somebody or do you not? That's not something that you can it can be hard to put a number to like, I trust this person six out of 10. Like, well, what does six out of 10 mean? Whereas your age is something that is, you know, that's a number that's easy to measure. You're 47 or you're 48, right? So for this study, what they did was they looked at qualitative data. So they interviewed individuals and then based on those interviews, they came up with different themes. So research indicates that African Americans are less likely to seek help from formal mental health providers. And this goes back to some of the um, lectures that we've talked about in previous, like previous lectures in terms of, you know, some of the research and studies that were done on African Americans in the past and how that is negatively, you know, not only impacted that community, but also, you know, essentially if, if I'm a guinea pig in your little research study that I didn't want to be a part of and never, you know, gave permission to be a part of, that doesn't really create or develop trust for me to then say, let me come and see you, you know, medical provider or doctor or mental health provider. So um, um, African Americans are less likely to seek mental health help from professionals and prefer actually to turn to the church for help for mental health and emotional problems. So the four study participants had each worked with a church's uh, counselor or ministry individual in both a volunteer and a paid capacity for at least a year and a half at the time of the interview. So three themes came up. That was role, responsibility, and religiosity or religiousness. We'll talk about each one of those. So the theme role reflects what the counselors believed were various tasks or areas of attention that the church could undertake in their attempt to meet the mental health needs of the congregation. So those tasks that the church, you know, that, that the participants believed the church could take include things like addressing a variety of mental health illnesses and mental health problems experience, experienced by church members, as well as providing longer term care that addresses both church members treatment preferences for long term care and more severe needs. So thinking about things like complex issues, um, you know, like severe depression or bipolar, that type of thing. Other tasks involved educating church members on mental illness and health and wellness and integrating spiritual aspects of mental health when addressing church members needs. In terms of responsibility, so um, essentially the church members viewed or believed that, um, you know, that the members or 
the like the members of the church are like the sheep of the flock and so it's the responsibility of you know church leadership essentially to dispel myths about mental health illness and wellness and because of the responsibility of trust or or um you know because of how trust has played a role in the past um there was this belief or this finding on in terms of responsibility that because members of the church trust clergy or leadership um you know there's then a responsibility for the clergy or the leadership of the church to you know take care of members of the church essentially so um, something to pay attention to or think about for us as counselors is if we're seeing someone who is say you know a pastor or a clergy member paying attention to they might you know they have all these additional potentially responsibilities that are like placed upon them because of the trust that the members of the church have in them or have placed on them um, in terms of religiosity so this theme highlighted how religion and spirituality can fun function as an asset of mental health and well-being but also operate to the detriment of church members which we talked about in a previous slide the respondents talked about how many many church members prefer to incorporate aspects of spirituality into their care but also many of them did not and so again it can kind of go both ways it's just dependent on what are individual preferences there um, in chapter in chapter 14 of your textbook one of the examples was Johnny he's having some behavioral health problems at school and at home and so um, I'm curious I'm wondering if like church members would have maybe been able to effectively help him um, in terms of thinking about you know some of the concerns that he was having some of the complexity um, but at the same time right for example if he starts thinking or experiencing psychosis for example maybe thinking that he's the messiah or jesus um, you know there's potentially only so much that a clergy member or a church leader or a pastor can do in that situation right because if you're experiencing psychosis you probably need some type of medication to prevent that and to go see a psychiatrist um, and that's oftentimes going to be at a higher level than what a church member or a clergy member can provide so that's something to also be paying attention to and thinking about of you know what are the different levels of care that are needed and um, relying on the appropriate level of care so if it's something that can be handled at this level then yeah handle it at this level but if it's something where you know a higher level of care is needed in terms of a psychiatrist a mental health hospitalization then it's appropriate to seek that level of care and not just say oh we can handle it down here like no you might be out of your depth you need a mental health professional here uh, so the results from this study was that the black church not only has a role and responsibility in addressing the mental health needs of African Americans not only within but also outside of the church um, and paying attention to how religiosity can be a facilitator rather than a barrier to mental health service among African Americans um, so this is important for us as therapists to pay attention to because a lot of our clients will have you know some type of religious or spiritual aspect that's really important for them and so how do we use that as an effective tool and a helpful tool within therapy as opposed to just ignoring it or saying oh religion you know religion politics some of those those topics are things that you're like oh let's stay away from this not talk about it but in this case it can be beneficial for your clients to discuss and explore as long as we as therapists stay open to whatever their perspectives are and open to incorporating it in a helpful and effective way in treatment so I'm not gonna say a ton about this documentary actually I'm not gonna be I'm not really gonna say anything um, I was surprised by some of the things that were covered in this that I never knew and um, had never thought about until I watched this documentary so this will be um, part of your discussion post this week which I'll cover in a couple slides so I'm gonna be really interested to see what kinds of reactions you guys have to this one factor to pay attention to with multiracial or biracial individuals is interracial marriages so interracial marriages used to be disapproved right um, it's like oh don't marry that person they're not you know they're not Asian or they're not black um, a great example of this is actually from elemental so her grandma dies and her grandma's last dying breath is like don't marry anyone who's not fire and then she passes away um, her parents so Ember's parents are also 
you know, strongly disapprove of, um, you know, other elements like water, etc. And so for most of the movie, she actually hides the fact that she is seeing this guy, Wade, who's a water elemental, um, especially her father would, you know, strongly disapprove of her dating someone else who's outside of her element. And so paying attention to how that might be playing a role especially if there's very strong cultural differences, it can cause, um, you know, a lot of conflict in terms of not only um, communication, but also different like family traditions or holiday traditions, um, different expectations in terms of how things are done or how you, you know, handle different situations. And so um, just paying attention to if that's present for one or of your clients or, you know, if you're working with couples, both of your clients and how that's showing up for them. I really appreciate that this video addresses some of the questions that are asked of mixed or multiracial individuals because there's several common questions. So I'll put the link for the description. Uh, I'll put the link for this video in the description. Supreme, the Supreme Court in 1894 actually ruled that if you had black blood in you, you would be considered a Negro or essentially a slave. And this is where the one drop rule comes from, which I um, hadn't heard of. And it's a way, it, at the time, it was a way for them to essentially classify people as slaves or treat people a certain way, of course. And this actually increased the owner's wealth, right? Because if um, someone was born to um, an African-American woman, and, you know, obviously you're like half black, half white, you're considered a slave, in which case the owner got wealthier. Um, we as a society, we really like to put people into boxes, right? And so this, again, coming back to this video is comes up in terms of some of the questions that are asked of people. I'm half black, half white, and I've lost count of the number of times that people have asked me um, or made assumptions about me either that, um, that I'm Hispanic or that I speak Spanish, or sometimes I even get that I'm maybe like part Indian because of my skin tone. And so it's, it's kind of funny to me now when people ask those questions, you know, cause I can tell they're kind of trying to put me in a box. Like, I don't know where you fit. So let me just, and sometimes it's very blatant in the, in the way that people ask. Um, individuals who are multiracial may struggle with identity or struggle with conflicting loyalties. So for example, um, if you're, say you're half, you know, half Asian and half black, there might be conflicting loyalties there in terms of, you know, am I more black? Am I uh, not black enough? Am I more Asian? Am I not Asian enough? And so you might experience invalidations from both groups, right? Like, oh, you're not Asian enough. Oh, you're not black enough. And so there might be a lot of mixed feelings or a lot of, um, almost like mixed loyalty in terms of like, well, where do I fit in? Um, you know, it's kind of this idea that they have a foot in each world and, you know, depending on how they're raised or where they're raised or what their culture or group is, they might struggle to connect with individuals from one group or both groups um, and kind of struggle to find their place in the world. So think about someone who, for example, is half black and half Japanese and they're raised in Japan where there's a lot of Japanese people, so they're really maybe connected to that side of their family or to that culture. But then what opportunities does that child have to connect with the black side of, you know, his or her identity and what that looks like? Um, and it's, you know, it's not something that uh, maybe parents or family members are thinking about in terms of how do we make sure to, to nurture both sides of this child or this person's identity both in this example, the Japanese and the black side, and not, you know, accidentally neglect one side or the other. Biracial individuals, I already talked about this, might struggle to find their place, um, might struggle to fit in, might feel like, well, I'm not really accepted in either group, or I feel alienated from both groups. So just some things to be thinking about and paying attention to, especially if you work with individuals who um, are my multiracial or who might look a certain way. Um, you know, one of my colleagues uh, that I previously worked with looked white, but you know, he's Hispanic. Um, and so it's easy to make assumptions based on how people look, but we as therapists need to make sure that and be very careful about not making assumptions just based off of how someone looks. <laughs>
Here are this week's discussion questions. I can't wait to see what you guys talk about and discuss in terms of answering the questions. This is my citation for this week. We covered some really interesting populations in terms of African American and multicultural, and there were several videos. So I'm really interested to see what you guys talk about in your discussion post, and please let me know if you have any questions, comments, or concerns. Thank you. Have a great week.